Hey everyone, and welcome to an incredibly special edition of Reverse the Verse. I'm Eric Kyron Davis, and I'm honored to be your host today. If you're a first time viewer, Reverse the Verse is our weekly QA show where we get a chance to answer your questions for everything you've seen for the past week. With our CitizenCon event happening in Los Angeles on Sunday, we're in a very unique position of having all of our studio heads under one roof. So we thought, hell, let's have a little fun. Let's take this opportunity and dig a little deeper into the behind the scenes of this event. But before we get started, as always, we want to really take a moment to thank our subscribers because without you guys, honestly, I mean, we couldn't do this extra special content, which pulls back the curtain, so to speak, you know, on everything Star Citizen. So here we go. Let me introduce you to these wildly talented group of gentlemen. We have to my right, CEO and project director, Chris Roberts. Hey, hello everybody. <laughs> we have our global head of production, Aaron Roberts. Hi. Our persistent universe director, Tony Zurvek. Howdy. Our Vice President of Publishing, John Erskine. Hello. And our Development Director, Brian Chambers. Hello. You guys have a lot of words in front of your names. Did you know that? <laughs> All right, well, I gotta be honest, guys. You know, <clears throat> honestly, ever since joining this team, um, you know, I've been absolutely mesmerized by what we're able to do globally. And uh, you know, getting a chance to see this progress shoulder to shoulder with our community was just incredibly unique and awesome. Like, the energy of these events, you know, I know personally it reinvigorates me, I think the team as well, to just really keep pushing harder. For example, when I saw that massive planet just show up on screen, the way, you know, all the way down to that rumbling dragonfly and those braids of glass, I mean, it's, I don't know. I, I felt so much more immersive and it was more intriguing than any game I've ever played. So, all right, enough mushy stuff. Let's just get <laughs> right into it. All right, so, you know, let's start off by telling me uh, what stood out to you this year, right? Brian, you, you traveled the most parsecs uh, to get here. So yeah, tell absolutely, me, tell me absolutely. what was special this year. Uh, I mean, kind of to jump on what you said as far as the energy goes, right? It's, it's crazy, it's fun. Um, it absolutely, you get so into it and so involved. So I was actually up on the balcony when we were going through the beginning of the presentation and before we actually got to the demo, yeah. because I know what people are gonna see, Literally, I went down and I physically sat on the floor, kind of right next to the chairs to be around everybody. That's great. And as I'm watching this and I'm hearing the reactions from people kept coming up and like touching me and Pat and going, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and the sandworm came up, you know, so it's, it was really twice. the whole thing. Twice. 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 Yeah, twice. Bonus. <laughs> bonus. 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 <laughs> but it really is a, it, it was, a, it was an awesome show. I mean, the energy from the backers and, and being able to take the time with them and, uh, you know, kind of hear their stories and how involved they are with everything. It's, it's, it's absolutely a, new, a unique experience in game development. Yeah, Did, how about you guys? Anything else stand out from this event compared to some I of the mean, past I events? I mean, I think for me, I mean, obviously the event, I really enjoy going there and, and meeting everybody. What I actually really enjoy about these events is, is, is uh, in terms of, uh, for the team, it really drives everybody towards getting stuff done to show the community. And so, yeah. and that's kind of thing, it really consolidates, it gets people really focused and to bring the stuff together. And, and so, you know, stuff like Gamescom, CitizenCon are actually really great moments for the team as well to get, the, to get stuff together, to get the technology to prove it and get it out. And then to be able to then, s you know, show it to everybody and get that feedback is always yeah. fantastic. Well, we rally behind this point because we know we're going to be live on stage. Yeah, yeah. Right. So yeah. yeah you, there's nothing more for this. Well, you know you've got a date you can't yeah, miss. Then. No, the date is there, it's booked, Absolutely. everything is sorted. Like, you, you're going to be there regardless, so mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I, I think, I mean, for me, it's definitely the thing that I, like, and you see it in CitizenCon, you see it when we do other events, like the GamesCon event, is that you get to be in person and meet everybody you're making the game for, and mm -hmm. you sort of feel how excited they are and yeah. what their, you know, hopes and dreams are and the things they respond to, and, 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 and there's an energy that comes with that uh, that's electric. And so, yeah. I, you know, and, and we all, you know, so we, you know, everyone, even when we're not at these events, you know, reads the forums, things on Reddit, what I, you know, and you get a sense, and it's really nice to have the community alongside you and giving you the feedback. But like when you're in person, it's a whole another level. And yeah. I think that's kind of, uh, you know, one of the things uh, that sets us apart is that we really try to focus on yeah. the community and actually interacting directly with, uh, you know, not just online, but even in person and bringing people together. Yeah. Uh, and you know, so in, in like the video we showed at the start of the show, the, the, you know that's the way we feel. I mean, we sort of feel mm -hmm. like the, you know, in some ways the, the community was, you know, well, well, not in some ways, it definitely was in the DNA of the game from the very beginning, even before we announced the game, yeah. we had the community uh, web, you know, we put the website together, you know, we, a whole bunch of people joined up 
got their golden tickets before we even announced what the game was going to be. And so it runs through everything we do, uh, you know, being very sort of community uh, centric. So it's really nice when you're there and you're, you're seeing it firsthand and you're yeah. meeting people are telling you their stories and you're seeing also connections people are making, uh, you know, in the real world based on the love of what Star Citizen will be or yeah. the experiences they've had even playing it right now in the early iterations of the various alpha builds. And uh, it's that, that's fantastic and always humbling to, to experience that. And so I, you know, it's a lot of work getting there, but when you're there, there's a certain adrenaline and a, and a, and a, 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 a power to it that sort of fills you up to carry on and you know, make things bigger and better and carry on going. Before the doors the open, me and another guy walked uh, the whole line. And we didn't realize it went around the corner and how far it did <laughs> and met so many people. In the process, there was a group of about eight people that came from Brazil. Wow. And I met two guys that came directly from Israel. And I was like, wow, this is nuts, right? Yeah. So people are really coming together. They're yeah, everywhere. Meeting. Australia, you know, all various over. places yeah, in Europe, you know, Germany, yeah. Norway, Sweden, and I, You're seeing people England, from the community France. meeting for the first time, mm -hmm. right? In face to face. They've been talking yeah. with each other forever online. So it's, it's a yeah, great feeling. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah, I, it was just completely an amazing experience. So, all right, let's dive in. We've got a million questions to go through. <laughs> cool. All right, Chris, <laughs> first one for you. In the slide specifically on the three, from 3.0 to 4.0, there was no mention of ships docking together. When will we be able to launch our snub craft from larger ships? When will we be able to transfer fuel or cargo between larger ships? Uh, so, uh, not in 2.6, but uh, we are um, aiming to get that functionality in somewhere between 3.0 and 3.1. So. Uh, refueling is definitely so, especially when you we move to 3.0 and we're in a full Stanton system. You know, people are going to travel, maybe run out of fuel. Perhaps they're going to have to get refueled, and uh, we really want to get the docking of, uh, say, the Merlin into the constellation done. So we've been working on sort of docking with a bigger ship, which is what we need for the Squadron 42 stuff when you come in and land, say, on the Idris. Yeah. Uh, so it falls out of that. So depending on where that ends up will sort of depend on whether it's in 3.0 or 3.1. Okay. All right, Tony, you're next. After watching the CitizenCon demo, will there be alternate options like diplomacy, bribery, et cetera, et cetera to gain access to mission sites without having to murder local, locals right off the bat? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't even fire a shot at Vincent when he started in the beginning. That's true. Uh, yeah, that's really the, the point of the whole game is to, as much as possible, put a system in place and then allow players to craft their own unique solutions you know, through the world, as opposed to what you see in a lot more linear games to where there's really only one solution, you know, one, one way you know, through you know, a particular you know, uh, obstacle. And so that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be able to negotiate with every character, but some of them certainly you would be able to. At other times, you know, uh, brute force will work best, but there will be many other yeah. options for you to you know, solve a given you know, uh, problem. Uh, so we're 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 trying to inject as much you know in terms of you know the ability for players to you know uh, craft the game to something that you know that's actually appealing to them and having that still work as long as it's logical you know within the confines of you know and I, and, I, the, and, I, and I think the say that the other thing I'd say is that you know what we showed we don't, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we're doing that we talked about like. Uh, sort of reputation mm -hmm. factions, right, mm -hmm. which would dictate whether, yep. you know, an AI yeah, on the ground yeah. is friendly to you or not friendly to you, or whether they would let you use their landing pad, you know, you would request it mm -hmm. and maybe I could use it, or maybe they, they wouldn't want you and they would shoot, shoot at you, or, you know, obviously the, what the, we did, the sand nomads had essentially sort of camped yeah. around the distress beacons to waylay, uh, you know, people from space coming to find out about the distress the, the beacon. And that's actually sort of what we, that's part of like a mission component. So that mm -hmm. would be one of the things that in the mission that, you know, mm -hmm. recover the distress beacon, like the javelin would be a template, but then with different sort of additional layers on top of it. One of it could be, uh, you know, outlaws or pirates, or in this case, sand nomads, uh, are basically using it as a honey trap to waylay people that get mm -hmm. there. But there may also be other aspects to it that would be potentially different that could be layered on top of the, the kind of scenario of a crash spaceship emitting a distress beacon. Right. And, so and, and besides the characters themselves, again, given, given the whole sandbox style of gameplay, it's always possible that you could you know, do things, exploit the system such that you, know, you can change their behavior without directly interacting with them. For example, in the case you know, of the, you know, the sand guys, um, you could you know, 
remotely detonate you know something that draws their attention away from what you want to get to and then you could basically you know sneak yeah. in mm -hmm. uh, so we're trying to put as much of that stuff in place again so that it increases you know the potential for the for the player to really you know craft their own unique solutions which we think in the end is going to not only uh, make the you know give the game a lot longer legs in terms of you know how long you're willing to play it but it means that everyone's going to have their own different experience experience right. even when and they're playing fairly similar occupation and to be clear on the subsumption that's kind of what the longer term subsumption stuff yep. doing it's not there right now right <laughs> so that's why we would have maybe shown some more stuff if we had all that done there but we're working on that that's actually tony's primary focus is working with that along with uh, you know the ai team and the mission team to yeah, and really flesh out that part of our kind of sandbox systemic behavior for AI in the universe. But, but it is, it, it's, it's a much more complicated under undertaking on the technological side to make everything systematic as opposed to you know, just crafting a linear solution allowing you know, players. If we wanted to do that, then we wouldn't have needed to change many of the tools you know, that we got if, when we licensed. If we wanted to do that, we'd grinding. be done already probably. That's exactly yeah. it, right? Yeah. 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 Or at least close to being done. So we're, we're, yeah. we're, 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 yeah, we're yeah. trying to put in place systems that will be able to, uh, that we're going to be using for many years to come. And so, yeah. and, and that permeates really all of the, the big ticket te technological items that we're doing is we're, we're, we're designing for you know, a decade long run you know, or whatever here and not mm -hmm. just to basically solve the short term you know, uh, problem and get it out the door. That's, sure. that's not what we're doing well, at all. As long as I can still murder the locals. As long as that's still an option, <laughs> don't take that away from me, <laughs> Tony. Okay. Running good. All right. All right. Let's kick it over to Aaron. Um, we know that there's a revamp on the Cutlass Black in progress. Will that be applied in time for the red and the blue rollout in Alpha 3.1? Yes. <laughs> okay. Wow. Nice one. I thought, keep, I thought I'd keep it nice and short. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron, Aaron's, the, Aaron's the antidote to Tony. <laughs> <laughs> yin and yang. You, you hear to hear, folks. All right. Uh, John, a little bit about Spectrum. Um, with the original Orgs 2.0, mm -hmm. right, becoming Spectrum, what does this mean for the other Org 2.0 features like Fleet View and Management? Sure. So those are sort of different topics. Fleet View is one and Management is another. Um, okay. We've, as we've looked at what uh, how to address those things over the last uh, year and a half or two years. Part of the reason we arrived at what Spectrum is today is because we want to do a really good job of those things and we want them to have meaning. Mm -hmm. So um, like managing your org isn't all that relevant if you don't have a good way to communicate or if there's not like alerts or things to do. So um, what will happen is in Spectrum, uh, as we move through the different objectives that we have over the next, you know, let's say nine to 12 months, we'll be taking the management uh, and the administrative functions that exist today on the website and bringing those into the Spectrum interface itself so that you'll be able to do everything you can do today plus a lot more. The technology framework that we're using allows us to develop very rapidly, especially with UIs and some other functionality. So we'll be able to achieve the objectives that we have shared before, plus some other cool stuff that all these like notifications and real-time chat and and um, this sort of game presence allows. So uh, we still will be able to deliver those goals, and I think there's a lot of cool new opportunities that come along that'll be that'll be good as well. Um, Fleet View is a, is a little different. We've looked at you know there are some tools that people have made today that we really like, the sort of maps of all the ships and different things. We're, we're kind of working with the game designers to understand how best to address that because we've gotten different feedback from different people. So primary thing is that we understand orgs want to be able to control the privacy of how those things would show up because there's got to be some strategic advantage to either knowing or not knowing what your org has or maybe there's some privacy that like I may have a ship personally that I don't want to be part of the org and all this. So we're sort of, you know, waiting on the game design on that side to come along and then, but like I said, we'll be able to do something really cool with the UI functionality that we'll have. That's great. So there's, there's really neat stuff. And Spectrum, I, it kind of continues to enhance the immersion, right? The, the idea of, of where this is going to blend in there, you know, kind of going back to the, the original adage of building the universe, keeping us all connected. It kind absolutely. Of feels like it's the same, yeah. yeah, and absolutely. I mean, and the, the goal is also to sort of make it so that your experience with Star Citizen is, is really 
sort of ambient all the time. Mm. You don't necessarily have to be logged into the game itself necessarily, but if you want to, you know, connect with people um, through your, you know, your mobile device or through the browser or through whatever, you could sort of do that whether you're logged into the game or not logged into the game. That's great. Yeah, and that, and that actually adds a lot of other interesting, you know, potential, like, you know, what we've talked about in the past, uh, everything from a friend of yours needs, you know, some money, and you're on a phone, so you obviously can't play the game, but you can certainly receive a request from him, respond affirmatively, et cetera. Um, your friend can invite you into a party so that as soon as you're home, you're, you, all you do is join the game, and you're automatically, you know, routed in with your friends who are already, you know, in mm -hmm. and playing. Many, many, you know, other possibilities to just you know, enhance the overall gameplay experience by bringing people together and allowing them to communicate regardless of whether they're you know, at that particular moment in the game yeah. or not. So mm -hmm. I can be sitting in a boring meeting bribing my friend with in-game currency and my boss will never know. That's ultimately the goal. <laughs> I hope yeah. you're not going to be in a boring meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not speaking as me, of yeah. course. Present <laughs> company None of my meetings are boring. <laughs> your boss, your boss will yeah, never know. Okay, wrong, wrong room, wrong room. Yeah. All right, kind of switch over, Brian, real quick. I wanted to talk a little about the tech here. Um, how much of what we saw at CitizenCon can we expect to see in 3.0, specifically tech-wise, was the question. Uh, everything and more, right? Um, the tech where it's, we're building, as we keep saying, this, this strong foundation, procedural planets and the atmospherics and everything that else is going in, subsumption as it grows and grows. Um, so everything you saw so far that we, we put out for CitizenCon will absolutely be in 3.0 and more, mm. right? Each system's gonna grow a little bit more, more fidelity, a little bit more in size, a little bit more in complexity maybe, maybe a little more optimized, right? Um, Pretty optimized though, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. If, if people look at uh, the, um, the home, uh, we put up, uh, we called it a homestead demo because originally it started as a homestead but it grew into something much more, but yeah. uh, you know, we actually left the uh, debug frame counter up on it yeah. uh, to show what it yep. was doing and, and the actual planetary tech is insanely fast because like Marco and Carson as they were writing it, we're, we're Building it um, with you know processing on the GPU and also yeah. multi-core processing and that, so it's blazingly fast. So most of the new stuff that we're doing is built with a completely different paradigm in mind mm -hmm. than say some of the legacy uh, stuff, and that's what we're spending all the time refactoring. But so yeah, that stuff's fast. What we have to go and get is like the game simulation and some of the older, more legacy stuff to be be optimized. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's going to be cool. There's, there's, I mean, we've we've got. Um, it, we're always adding stuff. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Kind of really quick going back to one of the questions we got a lot actually was, yes, what were definitely. the specs of yep, the yep. PC running the procedural planet? Now, we knew that question was coming. So okay, all right, we went to Dennis let's to actually it. go, hey, you built the machine. Yeah. Right? So Intel i7, 6 core, 64 gigs, uh, gigs of RAM with an Asus 1080 with 8 gigs. There you go. So I'm not sure on the SSDs. Uh, I think it was, it was uh, you know, we have a Intel... Yeah. Uh, we're partnering with Intel, they have Absolutely. this new SSD, yeah. uh, so they uh, sent us some of their SSDs and so we had one yeah. of them. I don't think it's actually the, uh, the future one that we may be involved in that's going to be super, super fast, although I think this one's a really fast, yeah. good one. Probably the key thing I, I is a, a single card, not two cards, so if yes, you want as a, you know, as a player to ramp your performance yeah, I, I find it more, telling, though, that so. that was the, the most asked question out of everything yeah. is by the time we had looked, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's I it. I mean, because people go, if I think it through, they go, wow, there was a lot going on there. What kind of rig do I need to be able to pull that off? Yeah. Right? Yeah, right, and it is you know it's not crazy components are there. They're definitely higher end, yeah. right? But that but that's always a big part of the problem, right? It's like there 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 are a number of people in the industry that can basically push things to the next level, but yeah. doing it such that you know you can actually get a Still, playable you yeah. know frame rate is a completely different you know set of problems. Absolutely. Yep. And you know there seems to be, as you and Chris were you know both saying, it's like there there's a constant uh, concentrated focus you know going forward, especially on all the new tech, um, to basically utilize additional you know CPU cores you know absolutely. Uh, et That's I have had that question a lot was with Frankfurt and Engine Tech and so on, and I would say yes, we're absolutely trying to future proof everything, mm -hmm. trying to build things now to mm -hmm. where we can look ahead and go okay. Where is it going with tech-wise and, and hardware-wise to make sure that we're as solid as possible? Yeah, totally. Tony, for you, what is the current status of instancing? How do you plan to keep playable errors expanding without feeling empty or risking crashing the server if everyone tries together in one spot? Well, 
We, we could, we're actually very close if we wanted to, uh, to do instancing now. I mean, we're, we're already effectively shunning players into instances every time they join an Arena Commander game. That's what's happening. We've already got persistence, so we can already you know, uh, save player state and restore it, you know, to, you know, to a particular configuration, um, you know, as you join a game. Um, and that's, that's already 75% of the way there. But Chris, Chris wanted to, you know, push the game to, you know, to, to a farther level versus, you know, um, you know, what all the, you know, what all these other games that approach this problem have done. And so what we're pursuing at the moment is really more of a, a completely unified networking model, mm -hmm. um, whereupon there won't really be, you know, a bunch of, you know, individual sharded instances of the game. Um, there will just be one world. And as you move around within that world, you will be shuttled, you know, seamlessly, transparently from individual server to individual server. And this comes with, you know, some technical problems, you know, and gameplay problems that we're going to have to resolve, and, you know, we haven't figured out, you know, all of those, you know, things at the moment, but we're working on them right now. Uh, for example, you may have mission givers that, you know, effectively act as a bottleneck, and there's too many players, you know, trying to, you know, talk with that guy at one time. How do you deal with, you know, things like that? Um, and th there are, you know, many different, you know, th uh, many different things, but it would become an extended conversation, go too far into all the details. Yeah. But, you know, the, 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 the big answer really is that we're, we're trying to, you know, discard that whole you know, players in little isolated instances, and put everybody in the same, you know, into the same universe, effectively simultaneously. Yeah, I, it, that's one of the things that stood out to me, uh, even back in the Gamescom demo, right? And I think I had a lot of people even come up and talk about the, the seamless transition, right? So wait, I was up in the sky, and now I'm on the planet, and I haven't seen a single. Yeah, well, we screen. definitely, but even in the instancing thing, you would still have that seamless transition. So it's it really, is more great. just about the fact that you know, there's, you know, there'll be a limit to how many players we can simulate on one server. Mm. So, I mean, right now it's 24 in Arena Commander, it's about 40 when you're running around ArcCorp, but really that's actually eight instances running on one server. So if you just times it by eight and figure it out, we could have 200 players if we could scale the game linearly that way, but right now we can't because yeah. it's not, parts of it are built for multi-threading, uh, you know, distributing to all the cards, some of it aren't. Uh, so, but that's what we're doing a lot of refactoring. So, an ind individual server instance could perhaps, you know, run 200 players a lot, which then is obviously a lot denser than what we have mm. right now. And you would still seamlessly go between locations. But on top of that, if you can mesh those servers together, and each server is sort of authoritative over a group of players, you know, and generally those players would be sort of based on co-location, and each server tells the other servers what it's done with the players it's responsible for, um, you. Uh, can sort of on a peer to peer basis on the server side, you're almost, uh, up, you know, you could have thousands of players being simulated all at once, uh, and, you know, but each server is only doing the work for its little portion. And that's kind of the, that's the new model. That's what, you know, we're not the only people that are working on this or trying to work on this, um, but it is the new model of sort of the big, yeah. uh, using the cloud to give you, uh, you know, a lot more sort of game experience. Uh, and that's and that's and that's where we're going. At some point, you know, uh, you know, we may even, you know, that may allow us to have two thousand people in the same area or whatever. But you know, what if there was maybe be ten thousand? And then at that point, we probably would still have to instance. But mm -hmm. at the beginning here, we're trying to make it uh, sort of not feel instance, so you would be gated. Like so, if there's already too many people in right. a location. Uh, you know, the landing pads are all full, you know, it's yeah. just like mm -hmm. you want to get into that bar, but it's busy because, you know, it's it capacity in the fire marshal would set it that shut it down. Yeah. Right. Just, so just like in the real world. Yeah. Set up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's kind of like the gameplay limitations, you know, that I was kind of referring to, which is just like in the real world. It's like, well, everyone cannot be in the same space at the same time. Now, you know, so the question becomes, how exactly do you, you know, represent that when you're talking about different things? A landing zone is one thing. Uh, you know, a player, you know, a, a guy you need to talk to isolated on a planet is a different thing. And so there, there's a number of different, you know, solutions we've got in mind for how to deal with this stuff. Um, there, another thing to point out is, so there are two major things going on with the networking. One right now is the whole, you know, uh, network, you know, the, the macro networking model that's going to allow all the players to you know s seamlessly exist with one another. The other one is just the low-level networking rewrite that's going to give us you know a short-term you know perf uh, well no it's not that's going to give us a performance boost and it's also going to make for you know just a much more you know efficient code base versus you know what we got when we inherited the engine. Um, 
that's that's going on right now. That's what we're expecting to release. You know, the the low level rewrite is what we're aiming to release with 3.0. The the unified networking model is something that's going to be post that. We don't have you know a specific date in mind. We will do you know aim to do a test of that system at some point next year to where we basically ban a number of servers together. Uh, you know, creating you know uh, a shard you know of, you know of sorts to where we're testing the concepts that we're talking about here, but on a, on a much more localized scale. And this should ramp the game up to, don't know, you know right now, but it should be hundreds of players in a given, you know, uh, in, in one of these meshes. Half of the stuff you guys say, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, I took one programming class and I realized I was not good at it. Uh, but this stuff is absolutely, I think, one of the most impressive and most mesmerizing parts of our game, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's uh, well, not just because it's be. over my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not just because it's over my head. <laughs> Uh, so speaking of that, Chris, you know, one of the questions that came up a lot was uh, specifically about the presentation. Chris, um, will we be able to jump, uh, excuse me, will we be able to quantum jump from Atmo like they did in the presentation? Uh, no, the, the intention would not be to allow you to do that. So we, we were only doing that for, um, well, and, and essentially it was done by Sean and Simon in their tech demo, but we, we put that in so we could quickly travel to the other planet without yeah. having to waste everyone's time. Sure. Uh, so you're definitely not going to be able to quantum jump that while still cool. in atmosphere. That would be cool. We could basically have like, you know, <laughs> if you want to make that dangerous maneuver, sort of like Star Trek here, just <laughs> basically, just, basically quantum, you just basically say, I'm going to go straight into the atmosphere, but I might take some, da I might take some damage yeah, and yeah. so okay, forth. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss it, but generally, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, get, you, you should be getting, I'm lose them in the atmosphere. You, you have to get to, at, you got to get it to space before you can yeah, engage quantum sure. travel. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the truth comes out, Aaron's always trying to add new features and Chris is always <laughs> trying to pull it back. The truth That's comes right. out. Yeah, that's there right. you go. Uh, John, uh, on the Spectrum side, will we have the ability to add uh, integrations like chat bots to help organizational channels? Yes. So we're building Spectrum on a technology stack um, that allows for that. Um, we're Principally, we're using React and Redux, which is actually an open source framework um, that is developed by some Facebook engineers. Mm. And so uh, it's really amazing everything that's supported in this technology. So um, bots and, and that sort of technology are available. As we've looked at, you know, the state of the art today with chatbots, there's not a lot of compelling uh, examples in the real world that we can point to. But we can, we can imagine lots of stuff that you could do with a chatbot in Spectrum, especially um, as an organization. Yeah. Like you could potentially manage, you know, org banking or you could, uh, you know, well, there's just a lot of stuff that, you could in, that we could envision. Cool. Um, it's not something that would be available, obviously, in the first release of the product, but it's definitely something that we're looking at. Um, we're particularly interested in finding some examples in the real world that we think are compelling that we could draw from. Uh, so you're asking for submissions for the Yeah, so the I mean, there. you know, yeah, like, I mean, especially um, over the last few days, uh, we had, I had a, a number of really engaging conversations at the event Sunday night with people who had lots of ideas about Spectrum. Um, we had a couple of groups of um, people here in the office yesterday for tours who also had some really interesting ideas, um, specifically, you know, hearing from people who are managing large orgs or um, in uh, several people that I talked to manage uh, or are involved with multi-game orgs and guilds and, and, you know, some of whom are enormous, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, so. Yeah, we definitely want to get that kind of feedback. That's definitely one of the reasons all throughout the development of Star Citizen, we want to release um, information early to get feedback. So this is no exception, of course. Cool. We'd love to hear that. And yeah, I'd love to solicit feedback from people. Yeah. I think one of my favorite comments after the Spectrum uh, discussion was, uh, this is Spacebook, right? Yeah, right. We call it Spacebook. Is it right? is, it yeah. is definitely a very specific kind of social network for Star Citizen, if you look at it that way. Yeah, we're, um, because we're able to you know, leverage a really cool technology that's in the open source domain now, we're not trying to 
see things and then invent our own fundamental technology to do it, yeah. we're able in many cases to actually leverage the same uh, frameworks that are driving uh, popular platforms. So uh, it's exactly that. Cool, that's great. Uh, Aaron, so uh, picking up ammo and AC from destroyed ships seems a little video gamey. Assuming no tractor beam or cargo scoop or something will that be existent, will this be limited to AC or can we expect to see this in the persistent universe? Now, the persistent universe is, is going to be um, very different and the Arena Commander is meant to be very much the sort of you know, virtual environment you go into and, and, uh, you know, and, and also I, you know, I can't say that it's going to stay that way in Arena Commander for, for the whole time either. It's just at the moment that was a, that was a very good way of getting some gameplay in there um, very quickly for, for everybody. But in the persistent universe now, when you, everything in the persistent universe is going gonna, is gonna to be done in a sort of a real way. So whether it's refueling or rearming, you have to go to a location, you have to rearm if you refuel, you have to have something to refuel you. Um, if you're going to pick up stuff, you have to go, you have to grab it. You don't just like, you know, drive over it or fly over it. You have to stop, you're going to have to tractor it in or you have to go and grab it and so forth. So you, we, we want to have that sort of much more real experience uh, yeah. in the persistent universe. That's great. Th has it really enhanced that gameplay, having those pieces in Arena Commander from what, what we've seen right, as far as our test goes? Well, it's still in the process. There you go. So it'd be hard. It'd be it'd be, it'd be uh, it would it'd be hard to uh, to to come. I mean, the idea was just a balancing, which is like yeah. you fire your missiles, and maybe if you're doing well, you get you get some more missiles. Then how do you reload? And you know, you you could land on a platform and then be on it for a few seconds and reload. Mm -hmm. People were sort of worried about well, what happens if people are spawn camping the the platform? Yeah. So we'll do pickups and sure. we'll see how that goes. So really, it's actually going to be uh, you know we have our own opinions, but. Uh, we haven't opened this stuff up. We've just done the flight model changes to the avocati, mm. or the avocados, as everyone uh, <laughs> yeah, refers to. Yeah. Uh, and they will also get to play with that and give us feedback, and then it will go wider to the PTU, and then obviously out to everyone. But that's what we're in the process of right now. Yeah. So we're in the process of uh, you know, performing play tests every day on Star Marine, on uh, Arena Commander, and uh, just trying to really sort of make those fun, quick get into well-balanced uh, multiplayer PvP situations. Mm. Uh, so, you know, people that want to sort of sort of train themselves dogfighting and train themselves running around doing run and gun combat, uh, they'll, uh, they'll be able to do it quickly without having to sort of travel large distances or sure. risk having their ship blown out from underneath them and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris, this is a good question for you. Um, in Alpha 3.0, how will the procedural planet tech be applied to our four planets in Stanton system, like Arcorp, Hurston, Crusader, and Microtep tech? Will these be the planets as they've been designed to be, or will be they be the stand-in planets like we saw in the V2 demo until a new patch? Uh, well, so no, we're definitely building uh, the Stanton planets to how their their lore is and what they're. So you know, Microtech is this sort of uh, you know whatever you want to call it, ice snow planet. You know, think Hoth from. Empire Strikes Back, uh, and uh, Hurston is a s s sort of over-polluted, mined-out planet. Uh, so there would, you know, potentially some of the stuff you saw in the Homestead demo would have some elements of more the deserty stuff, but um, there'll be a lot more kind of like petrified trees, and this whole place will be over-polluted, probably a polluted ocean. Uh, you know, in terms of Art Corp, um, you know, that's uh, some stuff that. Um, we are working on, but we do feel like we'll be able to sort of cover large amounts of the planet surface with buildings. Mm. Uh, there's a massive object rendering tech that we have uh, that's very efficient. It's all very GPU bound, and that's actually what does say all the all the rocks and all the trees that you saw in the sort of massive scale that you saw. That's actually sort of all pushed onto the GPU and yeah. done very very fast, which is the same way we would do sort of the buildings in ArcCorp. Crusader is slightly different because it's a gas giant. Uh, so it's a gas giant, and you'd be sort of up in the clouds, and then uh, the floating platforms. <coughs> so that, in some ways, is almost like a space station because it's sort of a platform you land on. Uh, but you know, that's that's uh, what we're focusing on. And of course, wasn't mentioned, but we're you know putting Levski in there, which is sort of a more kind of mining, kind of rocky uh, planet. So it'll be looking a lot better than what you saw in the Gamescom demo because that was Planet V V1 that didn't have all the echo you know, the ecosystems that we have and all the extra tools, which are getting better every day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what you will see when 3.0 goes live um, will be, an, you know, at least as good as what you saw at CisenCom, but most likely more better. Because the other thing is we're going, you know, 
more time to work on and a bit more polish where you know, what we put together, we showed at CitizenCon in the Homestead Planet, that was put together uh, in a relatively short period of time. And also the tools were still being iterated on, no, which tool, meant that the- tool, Tools and assets, and that's the thing. Yeah, well, so, which yeah. meant that like, so if they build an ecosystem where they do height maps and everything, and then the tools change like a week, two later, they got to redo it all. So that was happening a lot where things would change in the, the tool set that would like invalidate a lot of the work that was done, so we're yeah. redoing a lot. So, so as that tool set matures, which it is doing, uh, and uh, you know, the artists get more familiar with it, use more of it, and we do usability improvements, uh, you know, I think it's going to be spectacular. I mean, the, if you look at where our spaceships were when we first launched in 2012, and they got better in 2013, and 14, and 15, and 16, now you look at you know, what the, the, the vehicle team's turning out, and it's amazing, the same you can say on the characters. So, uh, so you know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm just excited by the gameplay possibilities that the text, because it's, you know, I, I mean, we get a lot of flack for like, oh, well, you know, you're, you're taking the time and the scope's increased, but the, the kind of gameplay that opens up because we can mm. flesh out these worlds, they're not just a, a very isolated landing area and you're sort of on a kind of, you know, maybe, you know, you, you don't have a loading screen, but you're still streaming in and you're on rails, go, rails going down there, which was the original design to whole play areas that are open planets with very, you know, different ecosystems. I mean, you could have, you know, all sorts of gameplay that you know you normally traditionally would not have in a sort of traditional space sim game. Yeah. Uh, you know you could have people stranded on a planet playing basically a version of a survival game. You can have people <laughs> playing domination to you know control their own parts of a planet that there's minerals they're fighting over. So the the, the possibilities of gameplay or adventuring or exploring. A, I mean it, it's like watching every sci-fi movie you've loved and you can create all those scenarios now and uh, th that's. Yeah, well, that, that's actually, it, it's, a, it's a good point because I think that given the level of detail we're going to be able to inject into these things and uh, the fact that the occupations, you know, will be able to take advantage of this in so many different ways. I mean, from a design perspective, you know, the, the difference between being able to land on realistic planets and control it to that level of fidelity, um, in addition to all the stuff that we can put in space and the transitions between them, I mean, it's, it's just, it's completely mind-blowing. Um, and I think that there's going to be a lot of players that are going to have all the content they, they want in just a small part of one solar system, you know, much less the rest of that solar system or all of the other systems, you know, that we're eventually going to Yeah, be I mean, I, I think the story and the adventures people will be able to experience in the, in the game, you know, when it's a little further along, it's going to be like nothing else. So, I mean, I, I'm super, I'm like, I'm as excited or energized now or more so than I ever have been because I can see all these pieces there. Yeah. We've got them all there and they're close enough. Yeah, we still got to create a bunch of extra content and we still got to make sure everything sort of connects properly together, but we're very far along on it. And so I'm not looking at any piece of technology to create this dream game that I don't feel we're going to have uh, or make work. So what we're really focusing on now is connecting everything making sure that it scales, it will run efficiently, mm -hmm. and we have the tools for our artists and designers mm -hmm. to work with. So, you know, next year I'm feeling like we're going to be, you know, it's the, you know, it's not the sky's a possibility, it's yeah, it was the, you know, whatever, the infinite universe <laughs> is a possibility. Well, th this is actually having ripple effects all through, you know, the occupations and how we were going to implement them, and it's opening up just you know, dr you know, dramatically different possibilities that we would not have had if you know we didn't have this technology available to us. All of a thing, all of a sudden, things like you know, discovery and mining um, and farming will take on you know, co you know, just many, many you know, new doors will open yeah. that I think players are just going to you know, get get a complete kick out of. What what mm -hmm. kind of challenges have been presented? now that you, we start seeing this stuff and it unlocks a lot, what kind of challenges are we having from holding back on going bigger or going more, right? What kind of challenges are we seeing? Because it's, it's got to be exciting, you know, specifically I'm looking at Brian, right, being in, in Frankfurt, not that we're not all seeing this, but in Frankfurt where you're doing all this tech and these guys are making these planets. And you just I, think, I think, I mean, we, we have to focus ourselves. I mean, we look at it. We, you know, our first and foremost focus is delivering, um, what the fans with the backers have asked for, yeah. right? People have funded us and they've said, hey, it'd be really cool if this and this and this, right? So that's really first and foremost our focus. But yes, with that tech, it has opened up so much. 
yeah. and we have lists and lists and lists and <laughs> lists of stuff. So yeah, like great. just on the, the scanning, which recently <coughs> came up, and so now you've got effectively a real world sitting right there in front of you. Yeah. And so it kind of plays to what the game has always been aspiring to be, which is we don't want to, you know, have, you know, these simplistic mechanics. You press the button, you do some sort of, you know, little, you know, dexterity challenge, and now everything is revealed to you. Just like in the real world, there are companies that have been hunting for oil for the last, you know, century on just one planet Earth, and they're still finding, you know, vast new, you know, formations, deposits, uh, et cetera, you know, to pull this stuff out of the ground. It should be like that in the game as well, such that here's a planet, and it's in a, you know, in a fairly populated, you know, safe zone, yep. and all of a sudden, some prospector goes out, and he discovers an incredibly valuable, you know, ore deposit right there. And yep. then the economy is going to respond to that immediately, and what that's gonna do is, it's gonna have all sorts of changes, you know, in, you know, in the economic system, and you know, and what type of com you know combat is occurring there? What types of missions are being offered to the player, et cetera? Until eventually, the system gets back into you know a state of equilibrium. The moment we got the first planet completed, and we were putting together the uh, pupil to planet video, mm -hmm. um, we were behind Hannes Apfel's machine, and he said, "Hey, come over here. I got this together." And he's working with Marco and, and a few of the guys, and we saw this little dot on the screen, and he started flying towards it, <laughs> and we stood there. Ten minutes went by. <laughs> that was a little bit bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, really? What are we playing on? Right? Some demo, dude. Really dot, great. And so, right? so he was going in and, and speeding the ship up. And, you know, we got a little bit closer and closer and closer. And you didn't truly understand scale, right? Seeing this tiny dot. And we flew in and flew in. And it occupied the full screen. And then we went in. And you're there on the surface. Mm. And at that point, just realizing that it, that entire surface area can be navigated somehow. And we're going to have hundreds of those. And you just went, oh my God. And yeah. things right? The, just the, the possibilities that you have, the real estate that you have to work with, to apply gameplay, to push for more mining, to, which then pushes potentially for more careers, and so on and so on. So it definitely it has more challenges, but I look at it as it gives us more opportunity um, and more opportunity to expand this game in ways that are unique to Star Citizen. Totally. Cool. We got a, well, as you'd expect, we got a lot of questions about procedural planets and the planet stuff. So, Chris, what uh, what kind of dark magic <laughs> allows the game to track an object that is on a ro uh, on a rotating planet and keep it all in proper relation to everything else in a massive solar system at a millimeter precision? Uh, well, are we, are we, you know, we've obviously talked about uh, the fact that we shifted to 64-bit um, mathematical precision. So, like, I, I do notice a lot of people get confused between. 64-bit binaries and 64-bit vector math. Um, so it's not really 32 or 64-bit binary stuff because that's not the issue here. Is we've moved the vector math from 32 bits to 64 bits, and that's important because it's floating point, and with floating point, uh, even though a 32-bit floating point number can describe a very large number, billions in size or much bigger than that, the problem is when you move to the big numbers, your precision at the low end becomes not, not very good at all. Like yeah. So all of a sudden your precision becomes in the meters or the kilometers if you get in really big numbers, as opposed to the millimeters, which is what we need, because no matter what, um, we're in first person, you can see your hands. I mean, there's not much distance between my hand and here. Uh, you know, all this kind of detail up, up close uh, that you expect to see, yet, that all this detail all has to exist in a, a star system that is millions, you know, billions of kilometers across. Mm. Uh, and so you just need a bigger range uh, mm -hmm. in your floating point to be able to ascribe, uh, high, you know, very, you know, high precision, but also the large numbers. And that's why we had to move to 64 bits. So that was, that's one of the things that enables the scale, say, that we showed in the demo at CitizenCon. Uh, where you know you can see this planet, you can f you know you fly past you know that that um, space station, and then we could have been way further out. I mean, the only reason why uh, we had the what was called track view, which is sort of the in in engine in game, that was all real time uh, rendered. You can see on the video, you can see the frame counter going. Um, is the track view is where we sort of put a camera on a spline path and fly it in, mm -hmm. and we basically did it there instead of you flying in a constellation, is because to cover that distance that we were covering in a short period of time for a demo, you know, we don't want everyone sitting there going, <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> setting behind how to the So we could have yeah. been further out and, that, the, uh, and, that, uh, and the planet could have been 
just a dot, yeah. or you never even seen it, and you fly and you go past it. But that's what you're doing. So you have to have this massive scale, but then get down on the ground and and you're driving around or walking around, and it's uh, has the you know resolution, the textile density of the detail of the the models, whether it's a plant or anything uh, that hold up to what you've seen in you know the most recent uh, first person game using you know on the highest end PC or uh, you know, high end, uh, the next gen consoles or whatever. Um, so, so you need the 64 bit to do that. So we've mm -hmm. talked about that. That's one of the things that enabled uh, 2.0, the large world. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second thing that we have on the planets, uh, which is also uh, sort of an extension of what we did for the multi crew, is uh, what we, you know we have our physical worlds that we simulate. And so we have more than one that we're doing, which we call what we call the physics grids. Mm -hmm. And so we had uh, you know the big global grid that is basically the star system's physical space. And then if you're flying around in a spaceship, there's the local grid, so the interior of it. And that's, in essence, its own separate physical world simulating inside a bigger physical world. Well, a planet is really just a big version of that. And we have a special version of a physical grid that is projected around a uh, planet sphere. Mm -hmm. And so when you transition in, and it's actually where we determine the transition is actually the atmospheric level. So that's how you know we detect when we do the atmospheric effects and everything else like that. There's a there's a certain distance above the surface of the planet that the atmosphere emits, and when you enter that, you basically transition into mm -hmm. the grid of the planet, and the grid of the planet is relative to the planet. So if we spin, it's in what we call the planet zone. Mm -hmm. So if we start rotating the planet, and and you're inside that grid, you just move with it because as far as you're concerned, you're relative to the world. You don't mm -hmm. care about where you are relative to to the the star system. And uh, so it's essentially just a very big version of what we use for spaceships, but uh, sort of projected across onto a sphere. And in some ways, it kind of simulates what really happens. It's a very coarse, rough simulation of what really happens in gravity, because at some point, you sort of enter, say, the Earth's atmosphere, and via its sort of gravitational pull, you become into the frame of reference of the Earth. Mm -hmm. And essentially, when you're in the local grid of the planet, you're in the frame of reference of the planet. Yeah. So it's not, you know, we don't have to be rocket scientists to sort of, you know, figure out all the kind of uh, trajectories that you do if NASA is figuring out, okay, we're going from Earth or we're going to Mars or whatever it would be. But um, we have, that, that does allow us. So if you're flying around in your ship and you come to uh, the, you know, whatever the planet is rotating on its axis, you come in, once you sort of enter its grid, you will now be in its in its uh, frame of reference. Um, and uh, so that's, that's, that's how we can do it. And that's the important thing to, uh, you know, like, so the sunsets and the sunrises are not us moving the sun, it's the planet itself moving. Yeah, well, I, I would add one more thing, which is this is just, you know, one of the classic examples on this project of building the proper foundation and how it has, you know, so many benefits down the road. If we, you know, back when the company was much smaller, there were a number of engineers devoted to this, you know, to, to this conversion for a significant period of time. In other words, it, it, it was a real investment when there was nothing to show for it. And then all of a sudden that, you know, that functionality was done. And now you could start to build upon that. If we didn't have the 64-bit space, we wouldn't have interplanetary travel. We could have basically done a little area where you can like run around, but there would be no way to get from that area to another without doing the instancing. Now that we have the 64-bit, now we have the option to basically have this exactly. seamless transition well, from planet to space I mean, station. If, if, now we have the option of the procedural planets. So, so, we could not have those and, and if, if we were and if limited we, to 32 And if we, had the th if we had 32 bit, we couldn't even have, even on the planet itself, the range we do. Because that's yeah. typically that's why absolutely. you know most games, yeah, whether it's clear. a battlefield or whatever, they have a certain limit to their map size. Because when you get to the edge of the map size, you start to have precision errors. Yeah. Because you can't, and, that, and if, you, if anyone remembers back in the old days of Arena Commander, when we had map size a certain size, and if you got to the edge, of the map size, you would probably see some handshaking because yeah. it was yeah. having precision errors. Mm -hmm. And but for us, when we say, "Yeah, no, that is not a skybox. That is actual. That's real mountain. You can go to. You can, but you can only really do that when you're doing the sort and so, of 64 yeah, and so, and so doing doing. things in this way, it, it inevitably makes you know the initial you know uh, you know the initial parts of the game much you know much more difficult, much more time consuming. You tend to see you know less up front, and then as you get these pieces in place, you do start to get you know I always say yeah, this it's exponential. It's the systemic stuff. It's like yeah. while you're down on the planet and you look in the sniper site and you can see the space station you flew past, mm -hmm. yeah. and that is the space station. That's mm -hmm. not something we faked in. That is literally the space station in the 
in the system app. But, but, but that changes all sorts of things. All of a sudden, there. all of a sudden, you can see it's like, hey, there's a raging battle going on there, and I know just because I looked up at the sky and I saw it. <laughs> so I run over my ship and I get up and I go to you know assist you know you know those guys et cetera et cetera. And so all of these things you know start to play off one another when you basically you know do them you know uh, to you know to this level of you know to this level of fidelity. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, uh, I can't believe even less than a year ago, right? We were transitioning from outside of ships inside of ships was was giving me a heart attack, and here we are talking about planets. It's, that's really exciting stuff. Aaron, yes, let's sir. shift focus a little bit here. Okay. Star Marine, a little more in the near. Mm -hmm. um, will we have AI combat modes similar to the Vandal Swarm? Uh, we certainly will, uh, but it won't be part of the first iteration. The first iteration is basically the balancing we're working on is all towards player versus player. So we're refining um, uh, you know, the animation sets, the, you know, um, and you know the, the combat moves. But, you know the way the way in, in a sort of a, a first to first person, stroke third person. Um, you can you can basically you know use cover and all this kind of stuff and, and so forth. Throw grenades, the works. You know it's that kind of level. So that's what we're gonna, that's what we're finding to get players into the game. And then that's what will come out with 2.6. But then shortly after that, then when the when the when the AI comes online, the AI basically will be in the game properly. First first the first you'll see of that will be in 3.0. Mm. Uh, well actually. You probably see some in Squadron as well, but basically that when the first sort of um, um, version where, where people will play will be in 3.0, and so on. so that would be the time when we'd actually probably have a, m a mode where you can actually go in with some of your buddies and actually fight AI mm. and have that sort of like level of going in, you know, trying to take stuff out and we can uh, create yeah, like, scenarios. like you know, outlaws defending a yeah. space yeah. station yeah. or a mm -hmm. ship. That you've got to take over or vice yep. versa, defend but, I mean, against outlaws. But the really, the really interesting thing is, yes, that's a scenario you can set up in, in Star Marine, mm -hmm. but the really interesting thing is actually the 3.0 stuff where you can be in your spaceship with your buddies and you come <coughs> across a a, an abandoned or a space station somewhere and in the actual persistent universe, you're doing the you same have to yeah. go in and take yeah. them out. Well, yeah, 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 no, you, you're, you're right. Would probably that's where, for me, that's the really exciting stuff yeah, in totally. terms of like making that sort of stuff. Yeah, like we'd probably do yeah. more of that, th yeah, exactly, on 3.0. Yeah. And then if you did something in Star Marine, it'd be more like a horde mode where you're yeah. just, you know, wave after wave. Space zombies. Out, it's yeah, space zombies. Well, not space AI, zombies, but AI, AI like space zombies. Yeah, it's when, like when AI and subsumption matures, yeah. right, it gets more and more and more and more, then the designers just start going crazy, yeah. right? So yeah. that's when it opens it up for us to, to create more play scenarios. Sure. Yeah. 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 But there's loads of stuff in terms of, you know, and, you know just, obviously this was specifically about uh, Star Marine, but just with the AI stuff, I'm really looking forward to it because there's so many things we can do in terms yeah. of, you know, have bases which are like actually, you know, protected by, you know, um, AI yeah. and so forth and, 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 and that sort of level. And so we can bring in lots of different things where, you know, so, you know, you can deal with griefing in some ways, which is, you know, which at the moment, you know, we just have to have green zones and stuff like that. And that's the level. Well, that, that's an interesting point because, you know, Chris has, you know, said before, it's like, well, you know, there was kind of no point to bring out, you know, Star Marine way back, you know, w way back when, after we wound up, you know, uh, releasing the, you know, that same level of functionality, players to go up against each other um, within the actual persistent universe. Yeah. Now, however, things are starting to change. We're very close to basically having the AI out. And so all of a sudden you see, oh, well, Star Marine will actually be a quite effective test bed for some of these AI concepts. So if you'd released Star Marine six months ago, we were still too far away on the AI to really you know, realize any sort of you know, significant benefit. But now these two things are you know, coming together and that's not really you know, a coincidence. Uh, all of a sudden, for the same reason we used Arena Commander to test and tweak you know, the, you know, the, the responsiveness you know, uh, of the ships and basically get that you know, polished so that when we were actually able to release players in the persistent universe, we had things working at a, at a pretty good level. The same is going to be true you know, with Star Marine and AI and all that type of totally. stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we've talked a lot over the, the, the time of the months of Sataball. So the Chris is. The Chris is. The question is, Chris, is it happening? Uh, OK, well, we're definitely, we will do Sataball. Uh, it will not be for 2.6. So Star Marine, the first iteration, will be, you know, as we talked about in Citizen Khan, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, you know, a small map, essentially PVP, and a large PVP map. Uh, and Satterball would be in one of the later iterations, wouldn't be in 3.0, but um, the ones later, we didn't really call it out, but it is on our roadmap for sort of the Star Marine, uh, one of the game modes. Mm -hmm. It's also something that we want to put in into the universe itself. So for instance, you know, we've talked about racing. So like 
racing's a mode in Arena Commander, but really some of the most fun racing will be like the in fiction, in the universe racing. So, you know, people can already see Pink in Grim, slips. you can already see in Grim, <laughs> Grim Hex that there's, you know, part of a race course that's already laid out there. And, uh, you know, in later, later iteration, we're gonna open that up where players would compete and yeah, I mean, maybe bet against each other with, you know, yeah, UEC. We wanna have, we, you know, we wanna, we wanna have like, you know, uh, you know, you'll basically get a message going on. It said, you know, it's the, the championships are on, make your, make your way to, you know, Grim Hex or yeah, yeah, this yeah. course, and everyone oh, will meet there and they'll have races. And, that and that, that is gonna suck, like, yeah. John was just saying pink slips. Yeah. Like, <laughs> all right. Race you fear, yeah. Put your own ship We're definitely, we're definitely, we're, yeah, we'll have, you know, down, right, you know, like everyone looks at the dragonfly zipping along and you're going, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, you know, pod racing. And yeah. we're gonna, yeah. and so, so we're gonna have all that sort of stuff. Um, and, you know, Satterball, <laughs> while it's not racing, is another sort of in fiction sport. Mm -hmm. And, we, you know, so we'll have it in Arena Commander, but, you know, potentially we could even have Satterball competitions of teams yeah, that are happening big, in. We want huge arenas. Universe. You go land, part your ship, you go in, and you, go, you start walking inside the big space station, and you enter the arena, and you go play against people and, and have other people watching that kind of stuff. That's mm -hmm. what's going to be really yeah. cool. Yeah. It's almost like going to, your, you know, to Sunday night football. Yeah. 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 And now I know what that guy on Spectrum was doing when he was transferring money from that, that meeting. He, he lost some pod race bets, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> some saddle. <laughs> so um, talking about the Sandstorm a little bit in, in V2, the, the demo, uh, Mr. Vincent Sinatra ran for his life. Um, let's, I want to ask a question about, you know, is that, was that long-term going to cause damage to their health? Is that the expectation, Tony? Yeah, I think the environment in, you know, in many situations should be at least as big an opponent to, you know, you accomplishing your objectives as other players or AI, you know, NPCs, you know, would be. Um, it's, it'll be much more than just, you know, sandstorms that can impede visibility or that, you know, could potentially actually cause you, you know, uh, to lose health. Um, we'll have, you know, on these planets, volcanic vents, uh, some ships, some, you know, you know, some armors some will sun be, worms. will some be, sand worms. Yeah. Sand will be more yeah. people uh, yeah. we're, hearing we're, high levels. Yeah, of I mean, we're, we're definitely going to have dynamic, dynamic weather and weather that um, sort of, you know, can impede or affect you or hurt you. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like we showed in the, the, the demo we did, you know, we, you know, you're arriving in your constellation going to the beacon and then, you know, there's bad air basically over that desert as you are, mm -hmm. and it was unsafe mm -hmm. to fly. So mm -hmm. you had to find a, uh, a landing pad that mm. was safe. Um, so that's going to be much more systemic. I mean, that's our goal, right? So obviously that was for that particular case. It was, we'd set up some of the events that would happen, but they were sort of on triggers when you're in that event. But we are actually, you know, I mentioned it on a Game of Nexus interview. We are looking at doing full, like, uh, kind of cloud weather simulation based yeah. on sort of, here's the planet, here's the heart, here's the cold areas. And, you know, we want to have that, you know, like, entry like in a sort of planet that has you know i don't know, uh, you know if you think of prometheus when they come in the entry to the planet mm -hmm. and prometheus or, yeah. you know, have all these things and also have encouragement for players to use different uh suits environment yes, suits exactly. or vehicles so you know give yeah. you a real like you can't always fly somewhere and, and get out maybe you have to land, take your rover to go somewhere, which is kind of what so we that, should That's exactly it. Some, some of the ore that you'll attempt to mine will give off, you know, so much electromagnetic interference to where you effectively have to touch down on your ship, and now all of a sudden you've got a real reason why you want to have that rover to make the, you know, yeah. that, that yeah. last 10 kilometer trip. Mm -hmm. But of course that opens up many more gameplay yeah, you know, and, possibilities and now that you're traipsing around. And if, you, if you're caught in the wrong area when the bad weather front hits yep. and you're not you prepared, you, you know, like a sandstorm, but yeah. rain, plenty of other things. Heat, yeah. electrical yeah. storms, impaired visibility you know there's a whole slew of things that we want to you know put into you know put into the system yeah my the real burning question was what was the name of the sandworm <laughs> what did we name the sandworm <laughs> we're not saying it <laughs> wow. all right um it, it was mentioned that subsumption is going to allow for 24-hour scripting right this has been kind of a hot topic with crews and you know big big ships how does that apply to the ai crew Tony? Uh, your, your, your crew, uh, NPC crews will <coughs> basically be, you know, they will follow, you know, normal 24-hour schedules and stuff. Um, now in Squadron 42, uh, it's a little bit different to where you go out on a mission and it's possible, we were actually just discussing this the other day, you know, me and Phil were, um, to where we may want to make it such that the on, on given missions, you're able to have key characters, you know, effectively remain awake so that you can communicate with them regardless of how long you're actually out doing mm -hmm. that because the clock is always turning and mm -hmm. 
yet your character may you know be out there for a 16, for a 20, for a 24 yeah, hour right. effective period. And so yeah. if you need you know frequent callbacks from the captain of a given ship, et cetera, then he may be willing, just like you, to you know to uh, to basically put his schedule aside and stick you know stick it out with you. Meanwhile, the rest of the crew, with this is really on a you know on a on a design basis, they'll determine when it's appropriate to you know rigidly stick to the rules and when we want to apply a little bit more you know flexibility to the mm -hmm. system. Um, but the the ultimate objective will be that the characters within the game will follow you know uh, you know uh, a schedule that's you know f uh, that you would expect to see in the real world the captain is sometimes on the bridge sometimes he's in the mess hall sometimes he's sleeping the gunners you know uh, the gunners sometimes that they're they're at their station sometimes you know they're in the rec room et cetera, et cetera. and this mm -hmm. will have again just like we've been talking about with a lot of these things this will have a lot of follow on effects in terms of you know how you go about you know uh, accomplishing missions and right such. and also so. I'm through that we have states so if you go if you basically you know, if, if, if we go to a state of um, emergency, then then all the, then all those crew know to go to their positions mm -hmm. and what their well, it, positions yeah. are. So it it, it, it right. almost becomes like the concept of food or fuel or anything else, mm -hmm. which is allowing your crew, you know, downtime mm -hmm. uh, is something that you're going to have to take into account. If you expect to, you know, head on out into, into space and you've got a large NPC crew and you just want to sit out there, you know, for hours and hours and hours, then you're not going to want to, you know, leave yourself that entire time in a, you know, in a dangerous situation or else you'll have to, you know, worry about, you know, crew shifts or, you know, because whatever. whatever. Could, could you could you deplete the energy of your crew, like accidentally? Well, we'd we'd, we'd wind <laughs> up we we'd, 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 we'd wind up modeling <laughs> things. I mean, there's a lot of different ways. You well, it's going to be it'll be like mini sims for the crew. I mean, yeah, they're going to they're going right. to need to be paid. They're going to need to be That's fed. Exactly it. And, and so they're going to be needed you, to get pets. I'm just every hour I'm going to throw a grenade <laughs> in a well. safe <laughs> spot just to wake if, them up. If you got to have bathroom breaks. If you push them beyond their limits, you know they they will they they will basically take it but they will start to become less yeah. happy. They will yeah. start to demand more money. Sure. Uh, effect, uh, eventually, their effectiveness at their, you know, at their job will start to you know, deteriorate. And so you can do this, but there will, there will be effects to it all. Um, all you know, and so the idea is that, as with fuel, you don't have infinite fuel, you don't have the ability to absorb infinite damage. You know, all of these things need to be replenished. There's mm -hmm. you know, a, a, you know, a cool down you know, a period of sorts for all these things, and your crew will be similar. Uh, I've said before, we, we don't want to become sim citizen. We won't, we don't want to make it this you know this mm -hmm. tedious micromanagement sim. So it will be nothing like that. But we'll have the concepts. They'll be very easily understood and accessible. You'll have you know the ability to control this to the level that you want, while at the same time simultaneously adding a whole lot of uh, different possibilities in terms of the gameplay sure. that you haven't seen you know elsewhere. Okay, everybody has to answer this question. What is the one role that you will not have your AI crew do for you? There's a one role you want to do on your ship. For me, I'm never going to pilot. Just say no, I'm not a good enough pilot. I'll always be on guns. I'm always a turret guy. <laughs> Aaron, what about you? Oh, you put me on the spot. Yeah. Um, what's the one role on the ship? Uh, I think I'd probably like to be the engineer. I think that's, that's, the, that's the one sort of, like, that's the cool one. I think that's going to be really cool. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, especially on those larger ships where you get to actually go and reroute power, work out what's not working, mm -hmm. call in problems, send people to fix stuff and all that kind of stuff. I think that'd be kind of a cool position. Yeah. Right. I'm going to give the, the, saw, the safe answer, but the truth <laughs> answer is uh, I want to do it all. And that's one of the things, honestly, that I dig about. Ah, oh, you're stealing my answer. I thought, mm -hmm. sorry, but no, no, that, oh, that's absolutely Well, I think honest. Eric's question was more like, which role would you not let the the AI do? Well, you know, but that's 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 said, and I was gonna say for you, Barber. <laughs> that's gonna, wow, that's gonna do. Whoa, he, he went there. He went there. there. <laughs> but honestly, I I'm the type of gamer. If you give me a bunch of different options, I want to try this out for an hour, and maybe I try play this one for a month, and yeah. then maybe I play this one sure. for a few days, right? And I really mm -hmm. dig switching it up because it always keeps it fresh. Totally, yeah. So the trick for me will be find the one I'm the best at and yeah. then maybe I'll stick with it. Yeah, yeah. Right. Tony? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm actually very similar, you know, as I've said in the past, it's like I tend to have... Where he could barber as well, right? I, I tend to have, a, you know, the, the type of mindset that likes to jump between different things. And so to me, I, you know, at times I'll feel like being the pilot, at other times I'll feel like being the yeah. gunner, at other times sure. I want to be sure, the engineer. Sure, sure. And so as I'm doing any one of those roles, I'm going to have my NPC crew fill in the gaps that I need to make, you know, to allow the ship to continue to operate. So, mm -hmm. you know, for, for, for me, 
it's you know it's the breadth of possibilities that you as a player can do in the game that really makes this. Yeah, yeah sorry, actually, I just so I just revisited what I think my favorite position would be. I'll be the guy at the bar. <laughs> there you <laughs> go. Yeah, the bar citizen. You're yeah, that guy. I'll do. I'll be that guy. Good. I'll just sit at the Wait, bar. Well, they, all, yeah, yeah, <laughs> ring around it's under fire. Yeah. It's losing power. I'll just sit there and I'll just bring me to it once. We gotta get this going. There you go. Are you supposed to do? Aren't you supposed to do in game something you wouldn't do in real life? John. For me, it's navigation. Uh, as we, on the platform team, worked on the star map last year, we spent a lot of time looking at route finding and, and that sort of navigation part. And so to me, that's pretty fascinating. Okay. So I'm a, kind of a map guy, yeah. so. Chris Roberts. Uh, no, I think I, I uh, you know, piloting, so piloting. flying, even though people think I crash into things. <laughs> uh, that, well, you, that, that's, that's probably what I wouldn't let the AI do. I would, I would pilot. Would you pilot for me? I pilot for you. I consider it. You could be on my. Oh, oh, you could be my wingman. There we go. Uh, well, but, but, we but get that's, that. Did we get that? Right? But that's an inter that's an interesting answer because in some occupations the pilot will clearly be the star of the show. In other occupations, it'll be more of you know uh, some that's sort true, of. That's true, but know, we didn't mid range role. We didn't discuss our occupations, did right, we? Right, right. But but but, so, but yeah. if you're always the pilot and you're doing some I'm, of the I'm, occupations, I'm likely not to be picking an occupation that. Requires me uh, the piloting, the flying around, yeah. the exploring is sort of what like, I like. On, on mining. You know, all the, all the yeah. fun stuff is you know really on the other roles and That's stuff. Right. Guys, these have been some excellent questions. But before we wrap up, we want to kick things over to the director of community engagement, Ben Lesnick, for a quick community update. Thanks, guys. Obviously, the big community news this week was Citizen Con, and I'd like to take a moment to offer my personal thanks to everyone who came out and made the event so spectacular. Um, it was really an incredible experience for me seeing backers from around the world showing up here in Los Angeles. Um, we attended a couple of bar citizens over the weekend and of course the big event. And uh, I just left wishing I had more time with all these incredible people. Uh, it is fantastic seeing the star citizen community come together, not over amazing spaceships or procedural planets or anything of that sort, but just because it's a lot of good people who enjoy each other's company and uh, I couldn't be prouder of what you guys have done. It wasn't just uh, citizens here in Los Angeles, though. We had 10 different bar citizen viewing parties around the world. Well, there were 10 official bar citizen viewing parties. I'm sure there were more that we haven't heard about yet. But uh, places ranging from uh, Seattle, Washington to St. Louis, Missouri to Paris, France, uh, all hosted get-togethers to live stream CitizenCon together. And it sounds like it was a great time everywhere. One group of folks who we could not have done without this weekend were the team of CitizenCon volunteers. Uh, Cameron Wilkie, our events person, put together a group of citizens from all over the place who came together uh, to set up the event, to keep it running, to break it down, to run the two bar citizens, and they all just went above and beyond in supporting us, and I can't thank them enough. Uh, but it is within my power to make them MVP this week. So congratulations, Star Citizen volunteers. You're this week's MVP. <laughs> Been a while since I've said that. Meanwhile, in spaceship news, the Polaris Corvette is now available. The Polaris is a fast escort ship um, inspired by the PT boats and uh, escort destroyers of World War II. It was originally announced by Chris way back in 2014 when uh, Foundry took our previous Corvette, the Idris, and turned it into a frigate. Um, so we've been looking ever since then for a chance to do this smaller Corvette that everyone has kind of been excited about, and uh, I couldn't be happier with the results. Uh, it's available in the Pledge Store through Monday, October 17th, along with a number of different ship packs that are military-inspired to go along with the theme. Um, so if you ever want a discount on the entire lineup of Aegis ships or just a couple of fighters or bombers, have that option through Monday. Um, I'd also encourage you to check out the Polaris brochure. Uh, the team in the UK put this together and it is my favorite brochure we've done yet. It's got uh, deck plans, technical specs, um, even a diagram of how the pool table works. Uh, it, uh, it turned out really well. Even if you're not interested in the Polaris, it's, it's a look into the Star Citizen universe, and uh, it's really, really enjoyable. For even more Polaris news, you can uh, check out the Subscriber Vault this week, which will show you some of the early shape language of the ship. And subscribers can also look forward to the uh, next issue of Jump Point, that's next Friday, which will walk you th right through the entire ship's development. 
And if you are on the fence about the Polaris, we also have a pair of Q&As where we are answering back your questions. The first one went up on Wednesday and hit some of the most repeated points. How long is it really? What kind of ships fit in the small internal bay? And the second one will go up tomorrow. If you have a burning question that has not been addressed yet, please post it to the thread on the forums and we will consider it for, uh, for the next Q&A. CitizenCon may be over, but SitCon is just about to start. On uh, Saturday, October 22nd, a group of several hundred backers are getting together in Frankfurt, Germany to celebrate Star Citizen. It's an entirely backer-run event, but it sounds very, very exciting, and uh, we'd encourage anyone in the area to check it out. Um, I know that Brian Chambers and a number of the developers at Foundry 42 Frankfurt will be on hand to uh, chat with backers and answer questions. You can learn more at barcitizen.sc slash events. Finally, uh, one last thank you to the community for all their incredible support. We have a free fly that is going on for backer accounts only, which gives you access to every single ship currently in the game. So if you've ever wanted to uh, race at high speeds in an M50 or explore an enormous uh, starfare, you have that choice for the next couple days. Please uh, enjoy. And again, thank you. You're a truly incredible community, and it's, it's an honor to be part of it. Back to you guys. I think we've gotten some really, uh, you know, one of the things for me is it's, it's not just fascinating looking forward, but also kind of looking back like we did here. So is there anything last you guys wanted to wrap up with or any last item we may have missed you wanted to cover before we say goodbye to all of the wonderful people out there for this episode? Just start with Aaron on this side. I was just start with me, yeah. Aaron, you're, you're the <laughs> furthest from me. <laughs> the spot you wanted. <laughs> I, I, mean, there's, I mean, there's so much that we could talk about as the issue in, in terms of kind of, you know, where we're going and, and um, and kind of just, you know, all the technology we're building. I think, you know, with, you know, Tony went into it before as well. It's like you build a base and now we can actually yeah. do so much with it. And, you know, and, and then the content side and so forth. And the, you know, the fact that just, in, you know, in, in, a very, in a very short period of time, we've actually quite a small part of the team is what the Homestead, Homestead demo was doing. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the vast majority of the team are actually working on um, Squadron or 3.0 stuff and things. And so it's, it's that kind of stuff which, you know, for me is, is kind of like the, the exciting stuff for us is you know, as we refine the tools, we've got the stuff going and work on this kind of stuff and things that makes a big difference. Yeah. But, Perfect. you know, like I said, the whole experience at CisenCon was fantastic. I, you know, I enjoyed, um, as always, meeting the guys, you know, having a few drinks with everybody yeah. and so forth. And, and it's like, it's amazing how many people you meet and, you know, s you know kind of become friends, you know, over that sort of period Absolutely. of time. Absolutely. To, yeah. to me, what I love to do, what I, uh, one of the many things I love about what I'm doing here, I mean, Frankfurt is the newest kind of team within this whole mix, right? I'm the newest guy here sitting on the couch. And just in these last 18 or 20 months we've been aboard, the, the amount of progression that we've made collectively, yeah. right? Yeah, Frankfurt's contributed, and absolutely, because we want to. We love what we do as far as each discipline, and we love the genre and how kind of bleeding edge it is. We kind of embrace that and go, mm -hmm. cool, let's grab this and see what we can do. Yeah. You know? so it's, for me, it's really just seeing that progression. When I'm on the, when I go on the show floor, when we have events and I watch people's reactions, it's because when I've seen it in the studio for the first time, I have that same reaction, mm -hmm. where it's going, oh, and that's that's absolutely no joke, right? It's you see it, you get excited, you go, wow, it's all these pieces come together, it's worked, you've worked out the kinks, you yeah. know. So it's it's really cool then to see their reactions, because yeah. you know exactly what they're feeling. That's great. Yeah, I would just say that uh, I think after, you know, uh, a lot of work, we're finally getting to the part of the project that I think is, you know, um, the most fun. And that is you've yeah, done yeah. all the hard work and the systems are now in place. There are still, you know, so, you know there, there are still a, a, few, a few large holes that we're working on as quickly as we can. Um, but as you know, all of these pieces start to come together. And I think that anybody that's been following the project, you know, from the beginning has certainly seen, you know, the, the increased, you know, uh, not just the, 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 not just the higher frequency of releases, but how significant the changes that are being, you know, uh, thrown out, you know, to the, you know, to the community actually are. We're no longer, I mean, if you think about back in 2013, you got, you know, the hangar module, you know, uh, the hangar module. 2014, you got Arena Commander. This was, you know, that was basically it for the year. 2015, you know, was, you know, predominantly, you know, social module was the, the, the notable thing. And now you look back over the last 12 months and you're getting, you know, large, 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 you know, uh, pieces of, 
functionality you know, uh, put out there. Yeah. I think this is only gonna continue to accelerate. And I think uh, a, a, re a really nice part from our perspective, I think, is that as more of these you know, pieces you know, come, into, you know, come into place, it's going to make the timeline much more predictable. Anytime you do vast quantities of R&D, you know, you, you, you basically lay out everything that needs to be done, you try to formulate you know, realistic schedules, and then you push as hard as you can. But there are always very many, you know, there are always unforeseen you know, obstacles, uh, problems that you know, pop up that need to be resolved, et cetera. And you know, we basically made tons of progress Certainly, over you know the last several weeks, as we were focusing on the the Squadron 42 demo, but even going back for, you know for the last 12 to 18 months, you can just feel it. It's it's, yeah. it's, it's tangible yeah. um, how much progress you know the the game you know uh, is now making. And so I just look forward to finally being able to you know show off some of these big things that we've been working on for a very long period of time yeah. and putting them out there and seeing you know seeing how the how uh, how the players respond to it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree, As, especially on the publishing side, we feel this pace that's increasing as we have more builds and we have more different uh, development streams that are progressing in parallel and then converging. Mm -hmm. And so there's more to test and there's more to publish and there's more servers to run and there's more you know, content that's coming. And, um, and so that has a lot of challenges but it's exciting too, uh, from like from my own personal perspective, it's now the case that things are happening so rapidly that I can't, just as one person, I can't keep up with every single thing that's going on. There was a time when I could kind of have my finger on the pulse <laughs> of everything, you know, but now yeah. there's way too much and I imagine it's everybody busy. feels yeah. kind of the same way. And sure. you know, we all sort of marvel at how Chris keeps up with everything because he's sort of got his finger on the pulse of everything we're all doing and plus yeah. a bunch of other stuff but yeah. it's exciting to see a lot of these investments that are paying dividends now and then to think about you know how where we're going to be a year from now or two years from now or five years from now so it's an exciting time to see some payoff from the hard work that we've done and then you know to think about what the future hard work is going to pay as well, so I think that's pretty cool. Oh. Yeah, just just to add that, I th I think that 3.0 is basically going to be when it really starts to feel you know like a complete, solid, comprehensive you know game experience. And if you look at the release schedule, you know uh, the tentative release schedule that we put out, you know at CitizenCon, every point release after 3.0 has significant major new content in mm -hmm. it. And that's only possible, and the only reason we're you know, putting that out there is because we actually feel pretty comfortable given, you know, given this solid foundation that we've, been, you know, that we've spent years building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so I mean, you know, a couple of things, I mean, I, uh, it's fantastic, uh, like looking at kind of the progress that we've made and what the technology is gonna enable us to do. Yeah. And I sort of look at all these toys uh, and the sandbox that that, that we're building and it's something I never would have dreamed four years ago when we launched this. I mean, we, we, I pitched a game that was a pretty big vision, but it's not as big as it's gonna be enabled now. Yeah. Uh, and I never thought we'd have the support so we wouldn't have the, you know, the time or the resources to do it. So, you know, we're sitting here in this awesome uh, you know, little stage that we can shoot our community yeah. uh, stuff in. Yeah. Uh, we have, you know, the studio here in LA, we have studio in you know the UK Manchester and Frankfurt in Austin mm -hmm. uh, and you know we've got uh, you know partners in Montreal Turbulent and behavior that are doing great stuff for us and other contractors in other locations and all that's enabled by the community and I kind of think that uh, you know citizen cons a time where you sort of it's about the community it's for them and reflecting on like not just that we're gonna be able to do this great stuff and there's this dream of the future but there's also how far have we come I mean you know, they've enabled this, the built, you know, built this company that's making this, you know, incredibly ambitious game, uh, several incredibly ambitious games. Uh, but there's also real content, real stuff happening. I mean, just having the streamers here for a few days, streaming like we had in GamesCon, have, you know, they were at the event, um, you know, you know, playing in the game in SC Alpha right now, doing really cool 
crazy stuff and a much more limited version of what the ultimate sort of sand, sandbox that Star Citizen is. Yeah. Um, just the organizations that are, you know, 40,000 organizations, uh, you know, the, the fact that people have made these connections and friendships. I mean, it's not everyone just hoping and dreaming about something in the future. Real things have happened and been built because of the community doing that. And from just that, uh, you know, from that base, we're going to go even further and build something that I think is going to, you know, I mean, hopefully, right? I'm, you know, don't want to sound arrogant, but I think it will be something that uh, will be a milestone for the industry because I think it's a different way to go about things. Yeah. I think we're definitely sure. developing in a different fashion, mm -hmm. being more open, um, and uh, it's, you know, so I, so, so what I think about CitizenCon is I just think thank you to everyone out there. Uh, that has supported us, that enabled us to get to this point. Uh, and it's really always great to, to mm -hmm. meet and connect directly. And that's kind of what we're about. We're doing it as much for you guys as it is for us. Because uh, I think we all have a mutual shared vision uh, and, uh, and dream. But we also have to remember that we've actually actually done a lot of stuff. And it's just going to get better. So anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's my, uh, my reflection on Citizen Talk. That's great. Cool. And, and I think that's a great way to end. So. Thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for joining us, and, and best travels to your location, wherever you're headed. Yep. And uh, we'll see you guys around the verse. See you around the verse, guys. Bye. Thanks. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, do it. Do it. <laughs> Thank you for watching. So if you want to keep up with the latest and greatest in the Star Citizen and Squadron 42's development, please follow us on our social media channels. See you soon.